Welcome everyone to Buddhist Center. My name is Jeff Allen. And once again, we are looking at bodhicitta from Pension Sun Andrapa's general meaning of perfection. So wonderful that we get to look at this text over and over and over again, so we can saturate our minds with the idea of putting others' needs before our own, the idea of becoming a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings, kind of motivated by our desire to definitely emerge from cyclic existence. Uh, we then recognize that uh, if we want to reach our full potential, uh, we then have to care for others and we have to develop this idea to put others' needs before our own. And that's how we can actually achieve a full bliss. So it's like a renunciation supercharged that says, I want to be a Buddha so I can have complete bliss and be the most uh, successful at helping others. Um, so uh, I think it's so wonderful that we get to meditate on the, the basis of the Four Noble Truths. Uh, and then look at how that actual truth of suffering and truth of origin, the truth of cessation and truth of path then relates to all sentient beings, right? Uh, because they all have those four noble truths, the, the, the sufferings and the potentials for the cessations of suffering, uh, just like we do. Um, and then we can start to you know, build more and more of a connection to sentient beings and a relatability when we know that we're all really, really in the same boat, in this same prison of cyclic existence. So um, make sure that when you do meditation upon suffering, it's something that you really, really feel. It's something that you really relate to your life uh, uh, so that you then, when you meditate on love and compassion, have material that made you feel a certain way, made you feel a painful way that you can then say, these other beings feel that exact kind of pain. Uh, these other beings believe that all of these things that they think are causing them happiness are actually suffering, just like me. <laughs> uh, so that's the whole point of getting a thorough understanding of the small and medium scope. It's because you can't say they're just like me if you don't know what you have. <laughs> if you don't know the illness that you have, you can't say, oh, they have that illness too. You can't diagnose them. You have to diagnose yourself first and then see that everyone who's bound to cyclic existence has the same diagnosis. So then you who are here, <laughs> you other than me who are here is bound to cyclic existence. So that means you have these same situations. You have these same feelings. You have these same thoughts. You want to be happy the same way I want to be. Um, so um, but you then experience this pain in eight ways, six ways, three ways, just like me. Um, so um, very important uh, not to just kind of disregard these earlier things and just kind of say, yeah, I get it. You know, life sucks, then you die, right? You know, that's something that, you know, the common person, you know, working on, on, a, on a construction site or in a restaurant, you know, the places where I've been around professionally, uh, you know, will tell you that, you know. Um, but there's a deeper understanding as a Buddhist of suffering that we're getting because they would not say that getting out of work and going home and being able to have that freedom was suffering. They would, they would see that that's the bait that makes, makes someone think everything is okay. And we as Buddhists understand that at a deeper level. And then that allows us to actually modify our lives in a more quick way you know we're we're more um in, urgent about it if we know that we're kind of kooky about the things that we are experiencing and the, what we think is good isn't really good uh so as these things arise the more and more we're familiar with their true nature the more we're going to react in a rational way and if we act rationally that leaves imprints of rational acting rational action rational karma leaves those seeds in our mental continuum <clears throat> so that in the future, we can be rational again. Uh, so it's this familiarization uh, over and over and over again um, with this nature of suffering that then allows us to be rational about what we think is happiness that really isn't and not chase after and be attached to things that really don't deserve that honor. They don't deserve our mental energy we put these things on a pedestal and, and they don't deserve it, but we think they do because we haven't meditated on the truth of suffering. You know, we've, we've blown that part off because we think we get it, 
because we understand what it means to be at work and, you know, think it stinks and then be able to get out. Woohoo. Right. You know, and you have to do that every day and it's hard, <laughs> you know, and that's what suffering is. No, no. Getting out of work and being able to, that's suffering too. Right. That feeling of, Oh, I'm free now is actually bait that's lying to you. Right. So then if you know that that's the bait lying to you, when you're at the work part and you think that that's so much suffering, it starts to even things out and doesn't seem quite as bad because the other thing is too. So you don't search after the getting out of work if you know that it is the suffering of change as much in your mind and you're more realistic about your moment when you're working. You're not looking towards something because you know it's an illusion. You're looking, if you're sitting there thinking, oh my God, I can't wait till I get out and then I'll be happy. That then I get out and then I'll be happy. That happiness is contaminated. It's suffering, it's a suffering of change. If you know that, you're not gonna long for being somewhere else. Right where you are at that moment is the only place you can practice spirituality at that moment. So how are you going to take advantage of that moment that you have no matter where you are? And how can you use this understanding and all this knowledge to make that moment work, right? Uh, and to make it work how? Spiritually. You have a leisure, a state of leisure, as we learned on Sundays. You have the leisure to practice religion. So, so do it, right? <laughs> so engage in it. So, so take advantage of the leisure that you have to practice it. Um, so what would motivate you to do so? Well, understanding the truth of suffering and understanding that everyone around is bound to it and all of these things that we think are our happiness, we're misperceiving. So we can start to kind of navigate life in a way that is driving towards a destination we would like, as opposed to the suffering of change, <laughs> right? A, a permanent destination of happiness, as opposed to what we normally seek out, which is an impermanent state of contaminated happiness that will change, which even in the highest peak of the contaminated happiness, when it's like the happy part, like the, Woo, this is the happy part, that's nothing compared to the bliss of real happiness that a Buddha would, would feel. That contamination, that underlying contamination is just saturating every moment in cyclic existence, no matter how high it up it is or how high you get. Uh, and it's, you know, not fathomable uh, um, for us uh, when we think about the Buddha's bliss. Um, but when we think about something like uh, my neighbor just had a baby, right? And, and he said, you know, I've never felt this much love, never felt this much happiness, right? This is a common thing you hear right after a baby's born. Um, and, you know, if you could then multiply that times a number of sentient beings, our little mind can't, can't count, right? Imagine, take that moment, take that feeling, take that happiness, take that bliss, if you want to call it that, right? Or, the, you know, like if it's the blissiest you can get in a human life, it seems like it sounds like it. From what I hear a lot, it sounds like that's that, you know, kind of interaction of the first, like, you know, few hours of human life with the parents as this special thing that goes on. I haven't had it, um, but it seems like it sounds pretty, pretty special. It seems like high human bliss, at least. Um, so imagine if you could multiply that feeling times however many beings there are, you know, in the universe, uh, multiply that feeling times that. Imagine what that kind of explosion of happiness would feel like. Like you wouldn't even be able to handle it, right? Our little, our little like selves, we want happiness so bad. Imagine if we got like thrust that much happiness on us all at once, we couldn't even handle it. Our little minds can't even count the numbers of happiness that is. <laughs> let alone be able to handle it if it happened. So anyway, um, uh, yeah. So let's get into a position that's intentional. Uh, the seven point Virakana posture that we've gotten into so many times uh, that will allow for our body to be in a position that helps our mind to have clarity uh, and allow us to sit for longer periods of time in the future uh, when we um, have the mental capacity to sit for longer periods of time our physical basis will support our mind's eagerness to sit longer. Uh, our legs and so forth and our body will be in a position where once we're more accustomed to it, uh, it will 
it will allow us to sit for longer periods of time and, and it won't tell the mind, uh, it's time to stop, your knee hurts, <laughs> or it's time to stop, uh, you know, you're slunched over uh, and your eyes are closed and you're falling asleep. Um, you know, so this body position is going to support the mind's ability to sustain meditation longer and then also align certain channels and so forth that it's not necessary to get into, but will then in the future allow for faster realizations when we are able to utilize the body for the practice alongside the mind uh, is kind of a concomitant to the spiritual kind of journey. Uh, the body kind of starts in the channels and the, you know, the winds drops, et cetera, start to be able to um, be supportive, you know, supports for our practice, if you will. Kind of, yeah, that's the best way to say it. They're, you know, kind of our excess, our supports or our kind of tools that we're using and that become uh, more accessible for us if, if we do this posture uh, um, when we are at higher stages and can use those kind of, of tools. Um, so, uh, hold on. Uh, so anyway, we'll get into the seven point Virakana posture, uh, put our legs into the uh, Vajra posture if we can, or half lotus, cross-legged, legs on the floor, whatever we can physically do. I put our hands right on left with our thumbs touching, making a diamond in our lap comfortably, our shoulders in a comfortable position, not slouched down, not arched back, just in a comfortable position with our kind of arms bowed out. Uh, then we have our heads slightly forward, eyes slightly open uh, uh, at a 45 degree angle. Um, our back is straight like a stack of coins. Uh, so let me go over it again. Our legs are in the cross-legged, our hands right on left, back straight like a stack of coins when we think about our vertebrae. Shoulders comfortable, head slightly forward, eyes slightly open, 45 degrees, looking at the nose, mouth in a comfortable position with the tongue at the top of the roof of the mouth against the teeth. Uh, and then we'll begin to breathe in and out of our nose, bringing the breath all the way to the top filling our diaphragm, a deep breathing. So we breathe in through our nose all the way. As we fill our diaphragm, our stomach actually goes out. We breathe that deeply, um, but we do it not forcefully, but not shallow. Uh, we do it very evenly in a very normal fashion, but filling our lungs, our diaphragm all the way up. So we're going to breathe in through our nose, focusing on the breath. Uh, and then breathe out through our nose, focusing on the breath and counting as we exhale. Uh, and we're going to do, do that for a number of rounds to, until we can get our mind uh, to a more level place, a foundation from which we can practice virtue, uh, which isn't running at things we're attached to or running away from things we hate. Uh, it's in this moment uh, of readiness uh, to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings, in this moment of readiness uh, to set a motivation of virtue. Um, uh, so we breathe in and out uh, through our nose, filling it all the way to the top and then exhaling and counting the breath. So we'll focus that now, focus on that now uh, for a moment or so. And then we'll add the image of Buddha uh, Shakyamuni in, our, in the front of us, in the front generation form. Uh, and then do a short meditation on the Four Noble Truths uh, and Bodhicitta. So begin breathing in and out your nose in the seven-point Vairakana posture. Imagine Buddha Shakyamuni in the space in front of you, about two feet away, about two inches tall, the size of your thumb, full of radiance, glowing, a light body, three-dimensional, an actual being, but a pure being like a diamond, not a normal being with blood and bones and guts and so forth and skin, a, a, a light body, but an actual being in front of you that is Buddha Shakyamuni imagine him or whatever meditational deity you normally uh, meditate on while we're focusing on the breath.
begin to think about why we're here tonight. Think about why we came to a Buddhist center in the first place, why we picked up a book on Buddhism. We had some questions, some dissatisfaction, we had some suffering, some pain we needed answers for. Rejoice in the fact that you can visualize such a holy being that touch such holy things who explain the truth of suffering to us. Buddha stated that this is the superior truth of suffering. Suffering of birth, coming out of the womb suffering, sometimes blue, unable to breathe, crying. Cotton feels like sandpaper on the skin. And that's how we begin this journey of suffering and this embodiment. And then we age. As we get older and older, the aging becomes difficult. We feel our body can't do the same things it used to be able to do. Even our minds aren't as sharp as they were. As a result of the aging, and as a result of this conditioned existence, we get sick. Illnesses sometimes that we have to bear our whole lives, terminal illnesses. And then we die. Death will come and nothing can stop it. We don't know when. Life is always being subtracted from and never added to. The causes for death are many and the causes for life are few. We think about these points. Think about the suffering of suffering, the manifest suffering that we all know about. And among those eight types of suffering and six types of suffering, being uncertain of who we will be with and where we will be. Wherever we will be, we won't be able to be satisfied. We'll have to be reborn again and again, shuck off bodies, go to the higher realms, the lower realms, and the higher realms, the lower realms, and the lower realms, and the lower realms, and the lower realms. Because we know that most beings go to the lower realms. That only things that we think are happiness, we believe will make us happy, we believe aren't cyclic existence, only those things. But the Buddha explained that those things that make us happy in cyclic existence are like bait that keeps us imprisoned, like an animal going into a trap, thinking it's found something sweet and now it's trapped again. The teachings say that the happiness in cyclic existence is like licking honey off the blade of a razor. Very sweet at first, and then suddenly the cut starts. Suddenly the pain starts. And that is the suffering of change. The self-destruct mechanism and the contaminated happiness. And the pervasive compounded suffering the suffering the Buddha said was really this the main part of this first noble truth, which was this lack of independence that we have because of our karma and afflictions that makes us forced into a set of contaminated aggregates again and again and again. The Buddha said this was the real, real issue, that this was all, no matter how high or how low you were, or how many of these sufferings you could get away from, uh, in whatever embodiment you're in, uh, you will have pain uh, and you will be forced into another set of aggregates again when the karma for whatever state you're in uh, wears out. Uh, so the Buddha said that this is the real issue. 
And then the Buddha stated that the origin of suffering, the cause of all of this suffering, uh, was ignorance. The Buddha stated that suffering is a result. All impermanent things that are momentary are results. They necessarily have causes. If something's cause is removed, it can occur. So the Buddha said that finding out what the cause of suffering was is is, is very, very important. And the Buddha stated that it's the ignorance that grasps that the eye is being truly established that causes us to have inappropriate thinking, causes us to have our afflictions rise up, uh, and then causes us to have contaminated actions that cause the samsara. Uh, and this happens over and over and over again. Um, and this cause being present makes it possible for the effect of suffering to be present. So then the Buddha said, this doesn't have to occur. Uh, this isn't necessary um, because of what I just said. I just said that suffering is a result uh, and it has a cause. Um, so the Buddha said that there is a potential for the cessation of all of the suffering and that he had achieved that state. Um, and not only had Buddha achieved that state, but had achieved a state of bliss somehow or another. Stay tuned. So then the Buddha stated that this is the path that I relied upon in order to free myself from suffering. There's eight types of suffering, the six types of suffering, the three types of suffering, however many types of suffering you would like to list, um, all of them are impermanent, all of them are caused, all of them are caused by the grasping at true establishment, and all of them can be stopped by getting rid of the grasping at true establishment. And the Buddha said, this is the superior truth of path. This is how, how one goes about it. Uh, this is what I, who've seen uh, the direct uh, nature of reality and have transcended cyclic existence, um, 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 uh, know that you need to know in order to abandon your origin of suffering. Uh, so uh, we should feel good uh, that we have an option, uh, that we have a way out of cyclic existence, um, and that we have a sure way and a reliable guide that will free us from cyclic existence. Uh, and the Buddha said that if you not only want to be free from cyclic existence, uh, but you want to have infinite happiness, if you want to have bliss, uh, then it's necessary to care for others. It's, it's necessary uh, for you to become a complete Buddha, uh, who is a being who puts others' needs uh, before their own, who is a being uh, who um, practice a path of love and compassion and has achieved the highest level of love and compassion. So, then we ask, well, how does one do that? Well, we begin by thinking of others. Uh, so we take this whole practice that we just did, this whole meditation that we just did about ourselves, about our own suffering, uh, about the situations that we've had in our own lives that have made, caused us pain. Uh, and we start to think about people who are close to us and how they have those exact same feelings of pain uh, and suffering. Uh, and how those feelings of pain and suffering aren't necessary. Um, so we start to think about that. We start to think, oh, I have a way to get out of pain and suffering. The Buddha has told me what to do, um, uh, but all of these other people have this problem too. Uh, and we start to think about our friends, and then we move over to our strangers. Uh, we think about actual people uh, in our meditation. We, we apply all these ideas to. We start to think about, oh my, uh, they have these same types of suffering I just thought about. Uh, they have to experience these things that are so painful, um, like myself. Uh, and then we move to enemies that we know we mislabel because enemies uh, have been our closest kin, uh, have been so kind to us when we were most vulnerable um, but unfortunately, we don't remember it uh, because it happened in previous lives. Uh, since beginning this time, we've been born again and again and again, and we've had every relationship with sentient beings uh, that can one can imagine. And a kindness done yesterday is still a kindness. Um, so we've only, uh, because of our ignorance, forgotten this. We don't remember how nice they were and how kind they were to us. Uh, and then now, they're under the influence of their karma and their afflictions, and they're acting in a way that we're finding as aggressive or we're finding uh, negative, or we're saying, oh, they're our enemy because they're doing something that goes against what you know uh, our needs are. But we aren't realizing that just like when we have outbursts and we say things that we wouldn't like to say um, because of our karma and afflictions, they're under the sway of their karma and afflictions uh, right at this moment. 
uh, they're like out of control, um, almost like drunk, out of control, like the same thing. When you, you become drunk, you kind of lose your ability to control yourself. Well, karma and the afflictions make you lose your ability to control yourself. Uh, certain karma is certain karma. Um, so it makes you lose the, the ability um, to have control. Um, and you know that you have that, sentient beings have that, they're having that, that moment of temporary insanity in the, in the scheme of beginning this time, because they have only temporarily are acting like this to you. In the future, they may uh, be your mother. In the past, they you know, were your closest confidant. Um, but now there's a misperception. There's a forgetting of all that kindness and only a memory of this very, very small moment. It's like just a quick blip uh, that really very, means very, very little. Uh, so uh, we look at it like that um, uh, and we start to right size our relationship with those that we call enemy. Uh, and we start to think about all these types of beings and then every other being as well uh, and their experience with the different types of suffering that they have to experience. The hell beings, the hungry ghost beings, the animals, the humans, the demigods, the gods. And we have a very clear understanding of the descriptions of all of those realms uh, so that we can truly, truly understand their sufferings, relate our sufferings to their sufferings, and then imagine that their pain could even be greater than the pain that we've ever even experienced and what that may be like if they're even in lower realms or if they're in even a realm that we can see an animal realm. Uh, imagine how painful that could be uh, being used and being you know, worried all the time that something was gonna eat you bigger than you. Uh, imagine you see that in real life in the empirical world. You don't have to look very far uh, to see beings who, you know, when my dogs run outside, run for their lives, <laughs> right? You know, they're enjoying their day and they hear the door open and they run for their lives. Um, you, you look out my back door and you can see the suffering of those animals, um, fearing, they're looking for food, so they're just trying to find some sustenance and now they're fearing running for their lives. Um, uh, we don't have to look at the hell realm uh, to find this intense amount of suffering that just is around the clock occurring. Uh, we can look right at the animal realm uh, and see that. So we think about all of these different types of beings and we start to think how nice it would be uh, if they had happiness and the causes of happiness. May they have happiness and the causes of happiness. I will be the cause of, uh, of their happiness. I'm going to do it. May the Buddha's gurus Buddhas, uh, and bodhisattvas please bless me uh, to be able to have the strength to do this. So we think about that. And then we think how nice it would be if these sentient beings had we're free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. I will be a cause for their freedom from suffering and the causes of suffering. Uh, gurus, Buddhas, and Bodhisattvas, please bless me uh, to be able to have the strength to carry this out. Um, so now I'm saying, uh, help me have the strength to free all sentient beings. Uh, and at this point we say, I'll do it. I'll take it on. I will, I'm going to free you all. Uh, hang on, I'm coming, <laughs> you know, and then we analyze our current state uh, and we recognize that we truly don't have uh, the ability to free all sentient beings from suffering. Uh, we know the recipe, some of it, right? Because uh, we've read something about Buddhism. We've had great teachers. Um, so we know some of the recipe, but we don't know each individual's recipe. We know the general recipe, but we don't know the specific recipe for each individual. And that gets very, very customized. And that's why you have to become a Buddha to be able to customize each recipe for each sentient being and, and cater to their needs in a way that will allow them to achieve bliss and a freedom from the suffering uh, as quick as possible. Um, so I know that I don't have that capacity at this very moment. Uh, it's really only the Buddha that has that capacity. Uh, the Buddha is truly the reliable guide as we have learned in Dignaga's uh, um, text, um, the Compendium of Valid Cognition. Uh, you know, the Buddha is truly a reliable guide because of the steps that the Buddha went through to become a reliable guide. Um, and we have this uh, uh, re reliable guide um, who is kind of like our, um, the image of who we'll become if we do what they did, um, not, you know, a lot of times we have heroes uh, or, you know, like a, a musician that we could never be as good as, you know, there are those, right? As a musician, you know, there's a musicians out there that like, I could like Al Demiola, I could never play guitar, no matter how, I just couldn't play guitar like Al Demiola. I know I couldn't, um, you know, 
there's musicians out there uh, that have a skill set that go way beyond uh, what my abilities are. Um, and I look at uh, that's just in 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 the kind of worldly sense. Um, I see beings like this and I put them on a pedestal because I can't become them, right? This is different. We're putting Buddha on a pedestal, but it's only because we can become exactly that being. Not their consciousness, a consciousness that's exactly like their consciousness, an omniscience that's the same quality, a love and compassion that has the same quality. Our consciousness can be matured to the same level of the Buddhist consciousness. Um, so it's this hero we put on a pedestal is just kind of like the picture of who we'll be. That's who the Buddha is. The picture of who we'll be, the picture of who we will all be, the picture who we all have the potential of the, the being that we all have the potential to become, even in this lifetime. Um, so it's a little different than a hero that's just the best at it and that, you know, no one else will ever be as good, right? If you're, you know, basketball player, you know, you have like Michael Jordan and things like that. Most people aren't going to get that good, right? Let's be honest with ourselves. You know, if you're shooting hoops, you know, you probably, you know, maybe, you know, uh, but, you know, LeBron James level, you know, a lot of times we have these heroes that we could never become, but the Buddha is a hero that we will become. Um, so uh, <coughs> we recognize that we have to become then a, a Buddha in order to be reliable, in order to help all sentient beings. So then uh, now we've done this meditation. We say, may I become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. I'm attending this Dharma class uh, to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. The only way I can fulfill all of my needs and all of sentient beings is to become a Buddha. There's no other way. The only way that I can become a Buddha is to get renunciation. The only way that I can get renunciation is by understanding the teachings uh, uh, for beings of small capacity. If I then have renunciation, then that will allow me to get bodhicitta. And the only way that I can truly become a Buddha is by having bodhicitta. So tonight we're attending a class on bodhicitta. Why are we doing so? To become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. So we're doing all of these prayers. We're engaging in the prayer of the Heart Sutra, making a mandala offering, going for refuge, etc. And we're doing so uh, for the benefit of all sentient beings. Uh, in order to become Buddhas. Um, so uh, that should be our ongoing thought. Uh, and as we become a Bodhisattva, that's all a Bodhisattva thinks about. I'm doing this uh, to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. I'm eating this to be able to be strong and nourished, to be able to uh, become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. There's nothing a Bodhisattva does that isn't saturated with this idea, I'm doing all of this for all of you, right? Uh, um, so and the more and more we accustom our minds to that idea, the closer and closer we get to being a bodhisattva, the closer and closer we get to being able to realize the seven point cause and effect for realizing the mind that aspires to enlightenment and real or equalizing, exchanging self with others, uh, or combining the two of them and creating the atomic bomb of causes uh, for uh, bodhicitta, you know, um, you know, the, the most powerful uh, causes for bodhicitta, putting the seven point cause and effect for realizing bodhicitta and equalizing, exchanging self with others practice together, which you can learn in this class as the stages go on. Uh, so rejoice in that fact and recognize that we're doing this to become Buddhists for the sake of all sentient beings. So imagine the space in front of you, all the gurus, Buddhas, and bodhisattvas, all your teachers. Imagine Kensar Geshe Wandak, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Geshe Aga, Geshe Lopsang Gompo, uh, Geshe Ma Tenzin Ladran La, Demolocha Rinpoche, Lama Zopo Rinpoche, uh, all these very, very wonderful Diglo Kensa Rinpoche. Imagine all these high beings, the Karmapa. Uh, imagine the profound view lineage of Manjushri and Nagarjuna and Chandrakirti and Shanti Deva and the extensive deeds lineage that has Maitreya, uh, uh, um, Maitreya and Asanga and Dharmakirti and Dignaga uh, and all these other holy beings. So we imagine these holy beings, the, the profound view lineage headed up uh, by Manjushri and the extensive deeds lineage headed up by Lord Maitreya. And we imagine Atisha and the Kadampa masters. And we imagine Lama Tsongkhapa. All these beings are in the space in front of us. They're all so happy that we've assembled here today uh, to listen to a teaching on bodhicitta, uh, to be able to become Buddhas for the sake of all sentient beings. So we imagine that all of these Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and Gurus and Kensar Geshe Wanda smiling like he does, so happy there in the space in front of us that we're carrying on 
uh, this lineage, carrying on the teachings, uh, doing all he cared about, and that was um, the work that it would take to become Buddhas, right? That's all that mattered to Kensar Geshe Wandak, and we're doing that work that will um, turn into the fruition of us becoming Buddhas. Uh, so Kensar Geshe Wandak and all these gurus, Buddhas, and Bodhisattvas are so happy. We imagine that all sentient beings are assembling around us. We can imagine that we've reached our, you know, uh, infinite arms out, right? Uh, uh, so many arms out and just grabbed them by the hand and brought them to this teaching or called them. However, we imagine that uh, as a result of, of uh, our knowing uh, that all sentient beings uh, can only be aided by a reliable guide, and that's Buddha. Um, we know that. So we've brought them all here to hear the teachings uh, of a Buddha, uh, to hear the teachings of Buddha Shakyamuni that were passed down uh, um, in a very unbroken lineage uh, to uh, the instructor this evening. Um, and so we brought all these sentient beings here, uh, and we imagine now that all the sentient beings are assembled all around us. The gurus, buddhas, and bodhisattvas become full of immense bliss, uh, because now uh, what they desire the most uh, for sentient beings to be, uh, become buddhas is starting to occur um, all at once. Uh, so all the gurus, buddhas, and bodhisattvas see all the sentient beings assembled, creating causes for their infinite happiness and freedom from suffering. And that's all the Buddhas, gurus, and Buddha, Buddha, bodhisattvas care about is others' needs and others uh, having infinite happiness and being free from suffering. So they see everyone there is here all at once and feel so happy. And this bliss makes them start to kind of emanate, radiate light rays and nectars in the color of white, red, and blue. Imagine that you and all sentient beings uh, that are all around you, right? Uh, have a white syllable om on your crown, a red syllable I your throat, and a blue syllable hum at your heart. Imagine every, all of you have that. Imagine now that the light rays and nectars, the white light rays and nectars are turning into white ohms and dissolving into yours and all sentient beings crowns and purifying all of your body. Imagine that red light rays and nectars are falling down uh, and uh, turning into red ahs, almost like rain or snow coming out of the sky and going into the throats of yours and all sentient beings, red ah that you have there and purifying your speech. And now imagine blue right, light rays and nectars are falling down uh, like snow or rain. Uh, and those blue light rays and nectars are transforming into whoms uh, and going to our heart area where our blue home and uh, other sentient beings, blue homes, heart area, uh, and, and purifying all of our minds. Uh, so imagine, again, from the bliss uh, that they're all experiencing because they're so happy that we're here, all sentient beings are here, and there's an authentic dharma that's being taught here. Uh, there's a dharma that will lead to Buddhahood being taught. There aren't ideas added in uh, that will cause us not to achieve uh, or uh, uh, arrive at our destination. Uh, all of the um, directions for the destination uh, are being given, so the gurus, buddhas, and bodhisattvas are so happy. Uh, so with that in mind, hold that visualization, uh, and then we'll begin uh, to recite the Heart Sutra. So as we begin to re recite the Heart Sutra, just remember that all the gurus, buddhas, and bodhisattvas, and yourself and all sentient beings that are assembled here are empty of true establishment, that the enlightened activities of the light rays and nectars that are turning into blue ohms, ahs, and whom, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, white ohms, red ahs, and blue whoms uh, um, are empty of true establishment. Uh, uh, so we imagine that this, all of the activities, all of the syllables, all of the sentient beings, all of the practices, all of the prayers that we do, are doing are empty of objective existence. Uh, they're they're uh, conventionally subjectively existent, but they're empty of objective existence. They're not truly established. So we think about all sentient beings, gurus and bodhisattvas. Uh, we think about love and compassion, caring for others and the motivations of all of these prayers. Uh, and then uh, uh, let's, let's begin uh, with the, the Heart Sutra. 
The Sutra of the Heart of Transcendent Knowledge. Thus have I heard once the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajagriha at Vulture Peak Mountain, together with a great gathering of the Sangha of monks and a great gathering of the Sangha of Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed One entered the Samadhi that expresses the Dharma called profound illumination. And at the same time, noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, while practicing the profound Prajnaparamita, saw in this way, he saw the five skandhas to be empty of nature. Then through the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra said to noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, how should a son or daughter of noble family train who wishes to practice the profound Prajnaparamita Dressed in this way, noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, said to Venerable Shariputra, O oh, Shariputra, son or daughter of noble family who wishes to practice a profound Prajnaparamita should see in this way. Seeing the five skandhas to be empty of nature, form is emptiness, emptiness also is form, emptiness no other than form, form is no other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, perception, formation, and consciousness are emptiness. Thus, Shariputra, all dharmas are emptiness. There are no characteristics. There is no birth and no cessation. There is no impurity and no purity. There is no decrease, no increase. Therefore, Shariputra, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no perception, no formation, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no appearance, no sound, no smell, no taste, no touch, no dharmas, no eye, datu, up to no mind, datu, no datu of dharmas, no mind, consciousness, datu, no ignorance, no end of ignorance, up to no old age and death, no end of old age and death, no suffering, no origin of suffering, no cessation of suffering, no path, no wisdom, no attainment, and no non attainment. Therefore, Shariputra, since the Bodhisattvas have no attainment, they abide by means of Prajaparamita, since there is no obscuration of mind, there is no fear. They transcend falsity and attain complete nirvana. All the Buddhas of the three times by means of Prajaparamita fully awaken to unsurpassable, true, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the great mantra of Prajaparamita, the mantra of great insight, the unsurpassed mantra, the unequal mantra, the mantra that calms all suffering should be known as truth, since there is no deception. The Prajaparamita mantra is said in this way. The meaning of the Prajaparamita mantra implicitly is the path of accumulation, the path of preparation, the path of seeing, the path of meditation and the path of no more learning. Deata Om Gade Gade Vara Gade Vara Zangade Bodhisattva Om Gade Gade Vara Gade Vara Zanga de Bodhi Zwadiada Honga de Gade Vara Gade Vara Zanga de Bodhi Zwadiada Om Gade Gade Vara Gade Vara Zanga De Bodhi Zwadiada Om Gade Gade Vara Gade Vara Zanga De Bodhi Thus, Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound Prajnaparamita. Then the Blessed One arose from that samadhi and praised noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, saying, Good, good, O son of noble family, thus it is, O son of noble family, thus it is. One should practice profound Prajnaparamita just as you have taught. And all the Tathagatas will rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Venerable Shariputra, and noble Avogateshvara, Bodhisattva Mahasattva, that whole assembly in the world with its gods, humans, asuras, and Gandharvas, rejoiced and praised the words of the Blessed One. Gala jube ne jo damba ne nguje du ju nga yi du do jen ju ba bo la ma yi bu jin zi ne zong gan ju zu la sha ze lo aga zomara te zan ra zomara ibe ga. Aga Zamara Jasanda Razamara Yamede Ada Om Gade Gade Vara Gade Vara Zanga de Bodhi Zaha Papa Gonjo Sonji Gai Dembe Doji Shi Lobo Doji Mebo Doji Shiwa Doji Jagi Baji Medu Vesha Danji Jitin Koyi Zo Agiri Danja Jiji Jivada Medu Nibi Jindan Jivada 
The fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this is a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure realm. Holy Lama's high wrap the sky of your Dharma bodies in massive clouds and knowledge and love. And let them pour upon the earth of your disciples as we are ready a shower of rain, the teachings deep and wide. <laughs> I send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious Guru. Yedam Guru Radha Mandala Gandhi Radha Yam He Zanye Jadan Zadye Janan La Yanju Badu Danye Jazuji Dagi Jije Jibe Zananji Jala Benji Zanje Jubajo Zanje Jadan Zadye Janan La Yanju Badu Danye Jazuji Dagi Jije Jibe Zananji Trala benje zanje dribajo, zanje jadan zadje janan la, janju badu danje jazuji, dagi jije jive zananji, trala benje zanje dribajo. The one who is transformed into the reliable guide, motivated by altruism to benefit sentient beings, the teacher Sugata and protector, to you I make prostrations. May this teaching be understood and heard in the language of all sentient beings. So we're so fortunate, right? Uh, we have this human life of leisure and opportunity. Uh, we have the leisure to practice Dharma. Uh, we have all the opportunities within our life to practice Dharma, inner and outer, uh, if we analyze them very closely. Um, but unfortunately, this human basis uh, is so fragile, right? Uh, and we don't know when uh, we will no longer have it. Um, and so many beings have wasted their time. Um, and we have wasted so much of our time with frivolous things uh, with, that will not actually make us happy. Um, so now it's time to uh, do something that will... Um, be a good use of this human basis that we have. Um, so what better way to make use of this human basis than uh, to study uh, something that can make us never have to suffer again and never have to worry about um, the death and impermanence again. Um, so uh, tonight we're looking at Panchen Sun and Rapa's, um, general meaning and perfection again, and specifically the section on awakening mind. Uh, we know that there are five divisions in uh, the, the general meaning of perfection to, in this section. The first division being a basis, second division being cause, third division uh, being nature, fourth division being divisions, uh, and fifth division being benefits. So we're in the second division in the specifics uh, uh, causes section, uh, and we're going over the equalizing exchanging self with others practice uh, that was passed down from Buddha Shakyamuni to Manjushri. Uh, to Nagarjuna, and then to other beings in the profound view lineage, uh, and to Shantideva, uh, and then it eventually ends up at uh, Master Salimpa, uh, and to Lord Atisha, and then actually Dharma Rashita, we can say, um, potentially is very uh, involved in Atisha's development of this, uh, and then Atisha passes it to uh, Drone Tompa. Uh, and then Drone Tompa is very selective about who he passes this teaching on to. Uh, so we're so fortunate to have a teaching given to us that even Drone Tompa 
uh, Atisha's root disciple, who, by the way, was a lay person, uh, um, was very selective about giving. Um, and uh, I'm just following the tradition in the order of the text. I haven't assembled a special group of all of you, right? You're all, everyone's welcome. Um, but isn't that amazing, right? Everyone's welcome, but how many will come uh, to hear such dharma that will, how many will in the whole world, uh, in all of the worlds uh, today in this 24 hour period, um, hear about a way to become a Buddha, right? And hear about the right way to become a Buddha. Not that I have some lock on the right way, just the, the way that the Buddha said to become a Buddha is the right way because he did that <laughs> and it worked. And other Buddhas did that and it worked and they all concur uh, that this is the way that it works. And they all concur after all their investigation, by the way, in Shanti Davis text, Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, that bodhicitta is the, the best practice of all. Um, so here tonight, we're learning about a practice that the Buddhas all concur is the most important practice. So, 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 so lucky. And not only a practice that leads to it, but a very potent practice that leads to it. Um, that's so potent that in the wrong hands, um, it could actually um, cause more harm than good. Um, but we know, uh, we can take comfort in the fact that Geshe Wandak, Rinpoche, and Geshe Lopsang Gompo, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama have taught us this practice. Uh, so we feel uh, we're in good hands uh, and we won't go the wrong way because they know we were able to, to, to handle this. Um, so listen very carefully though, as we go through it and understand what the preliminaries are and understand what it takes to get to this place where you would actually put others' needs before your own. Don't mistake it, do it too early because it can cause depression. It can cause a lot of issues and can throw you right off the path and make you feel like this just doesn't work. I just feel worse than I ever have. Um, so please, please, if you're doing some of these practices, make sure you have the foundation to do them um, and that you love yourself first so that you can love others, right? Uh, so that you really are a full being, you know, uh, that can export happiness. If you don't have any happiness to give, you can't export it. You know, love is giving happiness, right? If you don't have that to, to, to give, you know, there's that, that, that love to give. Uh, um, you, you can get into trouble trying to give away what little you may have of happiness or right uh, or understanding of what that may or may not be. So let's get into the, the body of the instruction on equalizing, exchanging self with others. So we decided that we were going to uh, divide this into nine categories, uh, um, just in order for ease of making sure we don't miss anything, and we were going to show how each of these categories build on one another and cause for the explosion of the mind that aspires to enlightenment. Okay, so we first have this, uh, we'll go through just the list, equalizing self and others, reflecting on the demerits of cherishing others, reflecting on the merits. I'm, I, let me start again. <laughs> Sometimes when you try to go fast, it's not good. First, equalizing self and others. Second, reflecting on the demerits or the downfalls of cherishing yourself. Third, reflecting on the benefits or the merit of cherishing others, okay? So those are the first three. Number four, taking on suffering of others with compassion. Number five, giving happiness with love. Number six, the actual exchange of idea. Number seven, a special recollection of their kindness. It's a remembering their kindness kind of on steroids. You know how we remembered the kindness of our mothers? Now we start to think about how through interdependence uh, beings are super kind. So it's, you start to see words that are the same as the words as they are in the seven point cause and effect, but don't mistake them for the same exact practice. Um, it's very important. Uh, so when you see sometimes the same word, you have to know the context, right? You can say the president, be like the president's here. Well, yeah, the president of the community college, the president of the United States, right? Or the president of the bank. You got to know what president you're talking about and be sure you're clear in order to know how you're, you know, going to act, react, or what you're going to ask of them, right? You know, 
you may you may have a higher ask if the president of the United States is here than the president of the bank, right? You know, so you have you, you know the context anyway, you, you know of, of what this means, and you know in in the case the president of the United States has more pres power than the president of the bank. Well, this the actual like recollection of kindness is more powerful, right? Than the recollection of kindness in the seven point cause and effect, even though it's the same name. Make sense? I think it makes sense. Okay, so ne next there's this paksam, the extraordinary attitude, uh, this altruism, this I will take it upon myself, uh, um, the task of you know freeing them all, taking them, you know, taking on their suffering and giving them all the happiness. Um, but it's been, you know, it's really, really been pumped up by a lot more reasoning and information at that point than the seven point cause and effect afforded it to. Um, so then the, the step into bodhicitta uh, is very, very forceful and quick using this practice uh, because of the amount of intensity of analysis uh, and the um, extra kind of addition of emptiness uh, uh, and kind of a broader view allows us. Okay, so we went over equalizing the self and others. We learned that others are equally as important as we are. <laughs> they want happiness, right? Just like we want happiness. Uh, you know, they're empty just like we're empty. We're empty just like they're empty. Other, you know, for us to say I'm I'm self, you know, there has to be something other than self. And in order for other to be, you know, say, well, no, I'm self because there's something other than me. There's this interdependence, and neither have any true established as the, as men as this or that, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, we're, we're, we're so quick uh, to say, no, this is, but this is me, right? I'm more important because it's me, right? Uh, but we're so able to throw me on a blob, right? When we come out of the bardo, a blob that's really just our parents' stuff. It's not you, that's another's stuff, right? And you somehow say, that's me. So why can't you say you're right, like have that same kind of understanding and start to move it towards, well, wait, other, I've already been able to labor, label other as, as important. I labeled this other stuff that now I'm saying is me as important, right? So I have this ability to label something that isn't me as important, if that makes sense. So. It's just one of the other analyses that you can do. If it helps, it helps. If it doesn't help, use some of the other ones. There are plenty in the Lojong teachings. The mind training teachings, you know, uh, there are so many different antidotes, so many things that you can think about and ways that you can and look at this stuff. So you see that you equally, everyone's equally as important. Everyone has Buddha nature. Everyone can be a Buddha in this lifetime. Uh, if you become a Buddha before me, you will be my reliable guide. If I become a Buddha before you, I will be your reliable guide, et cetera. Everyone has that same potential and there's no certainty that you won't get there before I will. No matter how awful you're behaving at this very moment, look at Milarepa who behaved very, very badly. You may become a Buddha before me. Milarepa became a Buddha before many people he behaved badly towards. So we have to look at that in the same lifetime that he behaved badly towards those people. So we look at who am I dealing with that's Milarepa right now? Am I more important than them? They'll be my reliable guy. If I knew that that person was definitely going to be Milarepa in 30 years, you know, maybe I am even going to be alive when they can start, you know, using the enlightened activities to help me. Right? So we start to look at, you know, everybody's equally important. We reflect on the, the downfall of cherishing uh, ourselves, um, you know, the demerits of it, of having this, you know, ego-centered, egocentric attitude. I grasp at the eye as being truly established. And then I think it's really all this, you know, I and mine, once I grasp at it, becomes very fancy to me. I become very attached to it. And, and I say, okay. I put a stake in the ground and say, this is mine and me and everything outside of it is other. This is mine and me, stake in the ground and that's other. And then we do this 
And then we go about life and we become attached and don't get what we want and are full of anxiety. We have aversion towards others and we get mad uh, and we build up all of these things in our minds and we can create these kind of sitcoms that go on and on and on and on about how these people are so bad and they're so evil and we've actually caused them to be mad at us in a lot of cases it says in in non capel's mind training like the rays of the sun we're so quick to wage war take out all of our weapons our best ones we have say the most clever you know strike at the heart as it says in the seven point uh um thought transformation geshe chikawa's lojong text never strike at the heart we're so quick to strike at the heart. And then we wonder why there's retaliation, you know? And then we say, they're our enemy, you know? We're creating this situation. And then when it doesn't go the way that we wanted to through our violence, through our belligerence, we blame them and we feel sorry for ourselves. This is a self-cherishing attitude at work. This chronic disease that thinks, this is going to make me happy if I only care about myself. And this idea that if I only care about myself, I'll be happy has never worked. Because we see the case of the neighbor who says the only time he's felt this much happiness was love, was caring for someone else. The only time he ever felt that much. So we're, our self-cherishing attitude is robbing us of that feeling multiplied by everyone. That feeling that my neighbor said that they had and so many people say that they have, that moment of love, my self-cherishing attitude is depriving me of that feeling times all beings. That's the one to blame for everything, as Geshe Chikawa says in the Seven Point Thought Transformation. Banish the one to blame for everything, the self-cherishing attitude. Everything that's wrong, you're going to find out, came from grasping at self as being truly established first. You start there, and then you cherish it. You wrongly grasp, and then you cherish it cherish it and don't cherish others. All ignorance, all misperception, all misguided, all this ego misguided, thinking, oh, this is what makes me happy. That's what makes me happy. And it never works. You know, it's almost like a slapstick comedy that you're, if you sit back from it and you watched it, you'd be like, this dumb guy, this dumb, what, what is he doing? He's still doing that. He still thinks that's gonna work again. He's re oh man, he's re he's like hurting those other people, and he thinks it's somehow harming others, somehow causing others' minds to feel bad, is going to make him happy in the end. It's like a slapstick comedy. Like we're we're so foolish, right? Um, but it's that car the karma and afflictions that we understand make us so out of control, and we look over at others, they're out of control just like us. Do we want forgiveness? We're so quick to want forgiveness. I'm sorry. Well, I won't accept your apology. I can't believe they didn't accept my apology. <laughs> you know, we just want to be able to say, I'm sorry. We could have done the most horrendous thing and just been like, in times in my life, I've done horrendous things, right? When I was younger and just felt like, okay, this time, everybody gather around. <laughs> This time I'm really, really sorry. So, you know, you should all just forgive me right now, you know? And then if there's any lingering of like, well, I'm just not ready to do that. We just don't understand how that could be. We should be forgiven instantly. You know, don't you understand? I was having a hard time. Yeah, everybody's having a hard time. We're under the control of our karma and afflictions. Yeah, you wanted forgiveness for your hard time. Forgive them for their hard time. So we start to see that cherishing ourselves isn't even logical. We want to be forgiven because we act crazy. We act crazy because we're under the karma and afflictions. They're doing it, but we don't think we should forgive them. But it's the same thing happening. <laughs> There's no difference whatsoever. It's the same exact thing. We want forgiveness. We think that we're not as bad, but we think they're bad but we're both under control and acting in ways that will never get us to happiness. And the moment that I start to see that, I can start to see a collection of parts moving that my karma has created and noise is coming at me and start to feel so sad that that person can't see that I'm just a collection of parts that doesn't have true establishment. 
that's here as a basis because their karma is forcing them to see me and feel compassion that they don't know that. They don't know there's just a collection of wailing things happening in front of them that's out of control and that has no true establishment that's empty. They think I am not out of control and that I have true establishment. They don't understand that their karma is forcing me to be here and my karma is forcing me to be here. I have more knowledge than them to be able to handle this situation that's happening. Am I gonna use it? Am I going to use this knowledge or am I just going to react so that I can experience another yelling person? So that I can experience another painful situation? So that I can have something 20 times worse happen to me and maybe the guardian of hell is yelling at me because I didn't just close my mouth and think about love, compassion, and emptiness, karma, karma and its results, my out of control nature, their out of control nature. It's the self-cherishing attitude that won't give us a second. It's just the self-cherishing attitude right now is saying, shut up. None of this makes sense. This isn't logical to me because I'm the most important person in the room. How could you say I'm the problem, right? You feel your mind doing it. You even feel your mind doing it when you think about suffering in the first noble truth the discomfort that happens when I start going the eight types of suffering. Think about when it happened to you. That, that's a self-cherishing attitude, having like a little earthquake. <laughs> like, oh gosh, I don't wanna think about bad stuff, right? Cause I, I only wanna be happy. I only cherish myself. You know, it doesn't understand, you know, it, 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 it sees everything so, so wrongly. So we see the downfalls of cherishing yourself, the benefits of cherishing others. We, we've seen beings that cherish others, they emit that glow. The Dalai Lama cherishes others. Gandhi cherished others. Mother Teresa cherished others. Jesus cherished others. Mahavir cherished others, right? Krishna cherished uh, others. Uh, you know, all of these uh, great holy beings uh, cherished others. You, you see that about them. Um, and they attracted people, you know, uh, because of that caring for others uh, and that love that they had for others, that altruism that they have for others, have or had for others. Um, and, and, and it really, you know, makes a difference and you see that their life isn't like, you know, walking over landmines and, and tripping over sticks, <laughs> you know, they seem to kind of flow, you know, they have a kind of a, they go about their day. They're happy. Dai Lama says, yeah, I do four hours of meditation a day to recharge, you know, <laughs> just to charge it up so I can go out into the world and help sentient beings. Right. Uh, it's different, a little different. That kind of being and that being's makeup, so different than mine. Uh, what, what's different there? They've made it their life's work to cherish others. I've made it my life's work to cherish myself. Chase after things uh, that will make me unhappy. Because we know that the suffering of change it is contaminated happiness. And every happiness that we have in cyclic existence is suffering. It's a taste of what happiness can be. So we have a frame of reference for it. So it's kind of like it, but it's not it. It's not happiness. It's kind of like happiness. So we, have, we can at least taste it to know what it would be, but we know it's not happiness because it turns into suffering. It would have to stay like that. If it was just happiness, it wouldn't have a self-destruct mechanism inside it. It would have to stay like that. Um, so it's like, you know, we're, we're looking for suffering all of the time. Um, uh, so instead of that, if we start to cherish others, um, you know, the self-cherishing attitude leads us to suffering uh, and cherishing others leads us to happiness, uh, leads us to that feeling that we talk about that. I've never felt so much love. I've never felt more happy in my life than that moment. It was always about love. Even if we look at relationships, think about it. When you, you fall in love, think about that feeling. That's pretty, that's the highest feeling, right? That's a real big feeling right there. It can make you act crazy, right? It can, when you have that drunk, that love that's just so blissful and happy, right? It can make you, you know, make decisions that don't even make sense, right? Uh, so you know what that, that kind of feels like, and it had something to do with others not you sitting alone, trying to figure out plans 
in, in blueprints, you know, to take over the world, <laughs> you know, to make it all of the external phenomena fit in exactly to the way that I think it needs to fit. You go here, you do this, you do that. Let's move this piece over here. Let's move that piece over there. And it never works out. And that's, that's that self-cherishing attitude. So then now we do the giving and taking practice. Um, so we went over it a little bit last week. Um, we're just gonna go over it again a tiny bit. So in the, the seven point thought transformation by Geshe Chikawa, uh, it says, start taking first from your own side. Um, so last week, we didn't really talk about it. The week before, we did talk about it, but let's talk about it this week. Uh, so when we're doing the giving and taking practice, we're going to do it taking and giving. It's called Pong Len, giving and taking. But generally, because you inhale, right? When you're breathing, you inhale first. We're going to do taking and giving. And it's easier for my mind not to mess it up uh, if I do it in that order. And, and when I look at this outline that I've been given that I find to be the, the best one, I see it's first taking and then giving, even though it's Tonglen. Uh, so we're going to do it in that order. So we first, and even, you know, it's, it's first, per, uh, first begin uh, taking progressively from your own side. Uh, it says it right in the, the Lojong too. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll begin with that. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, so we begin imagining ourselves, right? However you wish, right? In front of you, however. There's a lot of different ways to do this. We're just going to say, imagine yourself. Imagine your current sufferings. Imagine the sufferings you'll have next week, the week after that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Future life sufferings, this kind of reminds you, you know, I'll die and I could be a hell being. I could be a hungry ghost being. So you imagine that you are yourself in all of those situations. So it's like renunciation kind of preliminary in a way, because we know you have to have renunciation to get bodhicitta. Very interesting I, when I read this, right? Uh, and thought about it. Why is it there? Because you have to have love, love yourself to give love. So you have to first feel your worth having happiness and being free from suffering to be able to feel others are. So you first, even the, the great Kadampa masters and the Lam Rim and in the, you know, there's everything so strict. But it says first, you know, it, it says, you know, always abandon this cherishing attitude. But then it says first, love yourself. Take away your own suffering. And then you'll be someone who can really, really get to work. So it says progress, first start taking from your own side. So you imagine that yourself, uh, your future self, et cetera, et cetera, you know, in whatever forms, uh, however you need to get okay with that, right? Uh, you're taking on the suffering. Uh, in the form of a black light. Um, a lot of different meditations, but just do, keep it continuously the same. In the form of a black light into your left nostril, you can imagine that you're taking off the suffering. It's coming off like rays. Uh, you can imagine that it just, just sometimes they say that it's just almost heaping on your present form uh, and, and making it kind of all go away, like all of the aggregates and negativities. Um, but best just to take, imagine you're just taking on that suffering and giving in the form of a black light into your left nostril, inhaling it all the way into the diaphragm, right? So we see how the breathing meditation becomes important later on. Uh, and then exhaling, we imagine through our right nostril, um, all happiness uh, and so forth uh, and accomplishments are given to ourselves uh, and bliss. You know, imagine that these light rays just transform all of these uh, present and future states into bliss. Okay, so we start from this place that we've taken away our own suffering and we brought ourselves to a state of bliss. Okay, so this is the foundation for us to then to be able to begin to think of others. So we're starting from a foundation of confidence, freedom from suffering, and bliss. So we have more to give, right? We have more. We, if we're starting from there, we have more. Uh, so then we imagine sentient beings. And we, we do this uh, um, the way that we would in the seven point cause and effect. Remember our friends and then our neutrals uh, and then our enemies. And we build this meditation bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, we think about all these various types of beings. We think about the hell beings, 
hungry ghost beings, all these types of beings, right? In all six realms of cyclic existence, hell, hungry ghost, animal, human, demigod, God. We're thinking about all these various types of beings and beings who are on the path, who are higher than us, right? Uh, so they want the, the bodhisattva on the you know, ninth and 10th ground. They want the final obstructions to omniscience to be removed. They want that. That's their happiness. That's their suffering removed. So that's how big this meditation can get. And you imagine that you're sending out. And so when you're breathing in, you're taking on all of these sufferings of all these sentient beings in the form of black lights. Can you imagine like the sewage almost, dirty water, sometimes like you're shaving hair off and it's coming off these sentient beings. Sometimes they say scorpions and snakes, whatever you need to do uh, to imagine that you're removing the suffering of sentient beings. Uh, um, and of course, you know, uh, when you're doing this on the higher beings, you're imagining it in a different way. You're imagining, you know, these actual imprints and so forth, but just imagine they're all coming uh, to you. Imagine at your heart, there's a little black dot right here, <laughs> a little black heart, a little blackness in your heart. That's the self-cherishing attitude. Imagine that that black dot in your heart area is a self-cherishing attitude. Imagine as you're inhaling through your left nostril, uh, all the suffering of sentient beings in the black lights and ray, you know, and, and so forth uh, in those, those ways. Imagine that it's going in uh, all the way through your channel, uh, 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 channels in through and going to this black dot, right? You're inhaling and this air is going to this black dot, which is the self-cherishing attitude. And you imagine that it just burns it to bits. So as you take on this suffering uh, in the form of a black light, right? Or the things mentioned, you imagine that it goes in, you know, as breath would, uh, and then it carries this and lands on this black dot at your heart and burns up the self-cherishing attitude. Like you see soot, they say, smoke, but it's quick because now you have to exhale and give happiness, but you're breathing in like that. Uh, so you're breathing in, imagine you're taking on all the suffering and so forth, destroying your self-cherishing attitude, burning it to bits, you know, sometimes even in the wheel of sharp weapons, you know, it says, you know, you're imagining that like, uh, you know, things are stomping on your self cherishing attitude. Yamantaka is wheeling around like a weapon and chopping it to bits. Like, you know, there's a lot of meditations you can do. Uh, so don't limit yourself. Read a lot of Lojum uh, and see what really just changes your mind. It's about changing your mind. This is what it's about. Whatever works, whatever just will change your mind to make you care about others whatever works the best, use that technique. This technique works pretty darn well though. So now you imagine you don't have self-cherishing anymore. It's burned up. So now what can you do? Give love. So now imagine as you exhale, you've inhaled, you've taken on the suffering, it's burned up your self-cherishing attitude. Now, as you exhale, imagine through your right nostril, white, white light rays and nectar go out to all these different beings. And, and we imagine that these light rays that are going out are turning into you transforming into wish-fulfilling jewels that basically fulfill whatever need each being you're going to has. Imagine you're in the hot hell and you're turning into a breeze. Imagine you're in the cold hell and you're turning into warmth. Imagine you're in the hungry ghost realm and you're turning into satiation a drink. Imagine you're in the animal realm and you're, you're, you're turning into protection, turning into comfort, turning into freedom. Here, you're free to go. You can go roam now. You're no longer a slave that I take milk from and that I use for meat. You're free to go. You turn yourself into a jewel that gives them that wish. You turn yourself into a jewel that gives every human all the wishes you can imagine, mundane and super mundane. And all the high beings you imagine, wish fulfilling jewels, removing their obstacles, giving them happiness, giving them all of the things that they need in order to finish their last pathways to Buddhahood. Make the meditation as big as you can 
as many sentient beings as you can, and your mind will be affected more uh, by that practice. Uh, so that's basically the giving and taking practice. You start from yourself, inhaling your suffering, left nostril, exhaling happiness, right nostril to yourself, giving yourself happiness and taking on suffering. And then you do the same for all sentient beings. Uh, so that's the giving and taking practice. And you've really got to make sure that you're at a place that you've understood suffering. You have this kind of, even if it's a facsimile of, or similar to a kind of fake it till you make it type of renunciation, you know you have to have it because you go into this practice taking on your suffering, giving yourself happiness, and then boom, you're right into taking on the suffering of every sentient being, um, and you've got to be ready to do it. And it says in the Lojung teachings that you can do this. I know we're running out of time, but I, I want to make sure I complete this part. Um, it says in the Lojung teachings that you can do this. Suddenly you get ill. You can say, oh, my mind training practice is working. I've taken on the suffering of a being. I've taken on the suffering of all sentient beings. I was only imagining it. And now it's happened. So the great Kadampa masters use this mind training to find comfort in their own suffering. There's a really amazing thing that takes place that allows you to even be more comfortable with your suffering uh, if you can truly grasp how, you know, you're experiencing a suffering in the world. Hopefully, it's relieved the space for someone to experience a happiness, something like that. And even though we can't really take somebody's karma, we know that. Come on, we're Buddhists. Buddha would just show up tonight at my house and go, he'd, he'd hook me up. <laughs> he would. He'd get right in front of me. He'd be like, Jeff, sit down. I got to breathe you. I got to breathe you out. <laughs> but we're doing this so that we will eventually be a Buddha and be able to do it be able to connect beings to their highest potential at that moment at all times, right? And that's the only way we could take away their suffering and give them happiness. There's no other being but a Buddha that could do that for them at that moment. No one else, right? At that moment that could do that for them. So um, yeah, so we can use that when we have suffering or we have illnesses, we can imagine it's manifested. When we have enemies uh, and we're having a tough time, uh, we can use this meditation uh, and then start to um, um, fake it till we make it with this as well. Um, and we'll start to see that our relationship with them in our mind, because that's where it is all, <laughs> all of it's subjective, right? You know, um, you know, you see there are no beings that are, you know, objectively awful. You know, every ax murderer has a mother that said, it was such a good boy, <laughs> right? Uh, um, so we, we just, we have to change uh, the way that we perceive things um, uh, because all of it, it, you know, is from our side. Uh, so, you know, we can use these meditations to eventually be able to shape our lives into um, someone who, who could, you know, put others' needs before our own, who could take their eye out if someone else needed it. But Nagarjuna says, don't, don't, though. <laughs> if someone asks you for it because you're not a bodhisattva, you should just give the, you know, start with vegetables, giving things like that. You know, don't start with your eye. As, we, as uh, Westerners, we want to start with our eye, right? Uh, and then we get, we were talk, was talking on uh, um, TikTok about compassion fatigue. Somebody asked me to talk about it, right? Um, you know, um, and, and that's really from not having the foundation uh, and not having enough love to export um, and not seeing that our needs are important and we aren't bodhisattvas. In order to be a bodhisattva, you have to believe you're worth getting out of suffering. You have to want to definitely emerge. You have to believe that you deserve more than anything else in this world to be liberated, to care about others. Very, very, very interesting. So compassion fatigue comes from not being prepared to give out that much love. 
not being prepared, not having it, uh, uh, you know, not inputting enough good energy, you know, the energy you need, you, you, you gave too much out, right? Uh, you weren't ready to give out that much. Um, um, you needed to pace yourself more. Uh, you weren't a bodhisattva, you know, and, and a lot of people who get involved with spiritual practices uh, sometimes have a big heart to start. And this throws you in like turbo overdrive. <laughs> I've seen it in a lot of different forums. We'll just leave it at that. You know, you, you see, you have some kind of an answer and it's like, I got to save the world <laughs> right now. And uh, you're not ready to save the world. It's just kind of like a hollow sugar sweet thing that there's no real substance to. And you go out and try and do it all and you're not reliable, you're not qualified. And then you, you collapse and say that this stuff doesn't work. All this compassion stuff, I feel worse than ever, right? Well, it's because you didn't feel good enough yet right? The Buddha is the goal of someone who wants to be a Buddha is I want bliss. It's not, oh, I don't want to be happy. Let me feel as bad as I can all the time. Okay. I just want to work for everybody else's needs. No, the Buddha is super interested in bliss, right? Went through all this work to try to get it. <laughs> realize oh if i want to be selfish i better be smart about it i gotta you know you know i really really want to fulfill my needs you know i gotta work for yours okay oh that makes sense right it has to like come to that idea and was the first you know being when i say first like like the buddha is the only being who comes to that idea right that that um it's truly the truth that that i have to put others needs before my own that are and those others that I put before my own have no true establishment. Um, so amazing that we have this wisdom, right? We have this amazing Dharma that isn't missing anything. Uh, Ken Sergeshe Wandok just handed it to us and said, It's all here for you individually and take it. It's free. If you apply it to your life, you can have bliss. You can be free from suffering. There's nothing stopping you whatsoever. There's no one more important. There's no one with more potential. You aren't more important than anyone else though. You all lack true establishment. Abandon evil, engage in virtue, subdue your mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha, right? So hopefully, uh, we can get closer to a point where we only engage in virtue and we always abandon non-virtue and we subdue our minds. And the highest virtue is what? Love and compassion. So if we abandon negativity, we can get rid of suffering. If we get the highest virtue of love and compassion, we can have bliss. So that's why we're here. We're here so that we can all have bliss. So we can all just have that and not have to have you know, the, the suffering of birth, aging, sickness, and death, meeting with the unpleasant, separating from the pleasant, not getting what you want, and being having appropriated aggregates, right? We don't have to have that. It's unnecessary stuff. And that's what Kensu Geshe Wandex taught us because he heard the Buddha say it. And he came to the realization that it was true through inference. And he shared it with us. And we can come to the realization that it's true through inference. And we can realize it because we realize things from inference. So profound. So uh, with that, let's let's conclude. Unless anybody has any questions, okay. We'll do the eight verses for training the mind, and then uh, our normal ending. Eight verses on training the mind by Geshe Langritamba. With the determination to accomplish the highest welfare of all sentient beings who surpass even a wish granting jewel, I will learn to hold them supremely dear. Whenever I associate with others, I will learn to think of myself as the lowest amongst all and respectfully hold others to be supreme from the dairy depths of my heart. In all actions, I will learn to search into my mind. And as soon as a disturbing emotion arises, endangering myself and others, I will firmly face and avert it. 
I will learn to cherish ill-natured beings and those oppressed by strong misdeeds and sufferings as if I have found a precious treasure difficult to find. When others out of jealousy treat me badly with abuse, slander, and so on, I will learn to take all loss and offer victory to them. When the one whom I benefited with great hope unreasonably hurts me very badly, I will learn to view that person as an excellent spiritual guide. In short, I will learn to offer to everyone without exception all help and happiness directly and indirectly and respectfully take upon myself all the harm and suffering of my mothers. I will learn to keep all these practices undefiled by the stains of the eight worldly concerns and by understanding all phenomena as like an illusion be released from the bondage of attachment. So now again, we imagine all sentient beings are around us. All the gurus and Buddhas and bodhisattvas are in the space in front of us uh, and that all sentient beings and all gurus and Buddhas and bodhisattvas uh, are like illusions, are lacking true establishment, but exist conventionally. So we do this uh, um, visualization as we make a mandala offering as a thanks uh, for this teaching. The fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this is a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure land. I dedicate whatever virtues I've collected for the benefit of the teachings and of all sentient beings, in particular for the essential teachings of Venerable Lozandrapa to shine forever. I send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious guru. I dedicate all this virtue to emulate the knowledge of the hero Manjushri and likewise Samantabhadra as well. With that dedication is praised as supreme by all the conquerors to traverse the three times. I also dedicate all my roots of virtue for the sake of auspicious deeds. In the pure land surrounded by snowy mountains, you are the source of all benefit and happiness, all powerful Abhukateshvara, Tenzin Yatso, Maesteyasam, Stay until samsara's end. I pray that we may never be separated from Kensar Geshe Wandok in any of our lives, whether it's in the emanation body in our world or a world like this, or in the enjoyment body uh, when we're Arya Bodhisattvas. Uh, may we in all our lives not be separated from that being uh, in whatever form he or she chooses to show us. And may we become Buddhas and then help him or her uh, save all sentient beings from suffering. Okay, there we go. Uh, another teaching on bodhicitta and hopefully know a little bit more about how to care for others uh, and how to do this practice and why we do this practice uh, and how we can relate to sentient beings in a more realistic way in our daily life through this practice. So thank you. And I really, really so appreciate you being here uh, and the opportunity to do this. And please, everyone, remember. Uh, the Grinch uh, in your prayers, uh, who is uh, in a very difficult situation uh, and is terminal at this point. Uh, so please pray for him uh, to be able to have a peaceful process during this time. Uh, and then uh, when the time comes uh, for him to part, uh, at the time of death, may his mind be at peace and may all the gurus, buddhas, and bodhisattvas uh, be there uh, right by his side, uh, right there uh, at the time of death and in the bardo to help guide him uh, to a fortunate birth uh, that has leisure and opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful week. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on.